Welcome everyone. I'm Fred Kaiser and I'm your host here at the Fast Team National Resource Center. FA Production Studios at the Sun and, Sun, Sun and Fun Complex here at Lakeland, Florida. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this presentation and I'm going to invite you back for the next presentation as it is because the gentleman is going to be doing the one that follows this one. Our next presenter is the Chief Flight Instructor for the AOP Safety, AOPA Safety Foundation. He's a former Boeing 767 captain and Czech airman for American Airlines. He's been an active CFI for more than 29 years with over 13,500 hours logged. He teaches regularly out of his home base, Frederick, Maryland. He owns a Cessna 172 that he flies for both business and pleasure. And he's a regular on the aviation speaking circuit, appearing at, of course, here, Sun and Fun, AOP Expo, local 99 groups, and a member of the Civil Air Patrol. His topic is mastering takeoff and landings. And at this time, I would like for you all to welcome JJ Greenway. Thank you very much, Fred. You know, it's funny, one of, the, uh, one of the quirks I have in speaking is I always like to wear a sport coat when I get up uh, on the stage. And when you come to Sun and Fun, there's only two people wandering around the ground with sport coats on, Fred's one of them. So uh, I always feel at home when I come here to, uh, to talk because I always know somebody in the building here, since we have air conditioning, will have a coat on. Do we have any, uh, let's see, I like to ask if we have any lawyers in the crowd first, but I'm not going to do that. Do we have any non-flying spouses in the crowd? Oh, good, okay. All right, well, you can appreciate this. Um, I've been coming to Sun and Fun for a couple of years, and I've only come uh, with my wife just once, and that was the first time we came to Sun and Fun. And uh, it was my birthday, and my, my buddy Tom called me up the night before, and uh, he said, hey, for your birthday, I'm, I want to take you to Sun and Fun in my new airplane, and uh, your wife will really enjoy it. And my buddy Tom had just gotten a new airplane, so he stopped by Frederick, Maryland, and uh, loaded us on board, and here's us on our way to Sun and Fun the first time my wife came to Sun and Fun with me. And uh, I sat back in that chair, and I peeked up in the cockpit, and I saw, didn't see an airspeed indicator. I saw a Mach indicator, and it was hovering right up around 0.9 Mach, so we were going pretty fast, I reckon. And the uh, airplane was built by a guy named Bill, uh, Bill Lear, I guess it was, somebody like that. So my wife thought that's how everybody came to Sun and Fun, so she was a little spoiled the first time around. So the next year, when it came time to go to Sun and Fun, I was on my way down. Um, we got a couple airplanes out in our hangar, and uh, we got all loaded up, and uh, <coughs> She decided she wasn't going to come all the way to Sun and Fun in a J3 Cubs, so I came by myself that year. So since then, uh, she stayed at home unless my buddy Tom coughs up for another, another ride in his Lear 60. So that's just as well. We've got a lot, a lot of business to conduct down here, and uh, I like walking around and getting my feet dusty out and seeing all the new sights. Uh, a couple of things on the uh, WINGS program. If anyone wants WINGS credit for this, um, there will be uh, gentlemen circulating a clipboard and you can sign up for that and uh, we'll get you all squared away with getting some wings credit for the course. Word for our airport support network and these folks are over in the AOPA tent if you haven't had a chance to visit them stop by. Basically what they do is um, they try to identify airports that are in danger of being closed down or airports in danger of having noise restrictions put up and AOPA tries to have uh, eyes and ears and feet on the ground for every public use airport and private use airport uh, if necessary in the United States and there's over 5,000 of them and so far we have about 2,000 volunteers in our network that just kind of let us know if they read something in the paper if they hear some uh, encroachment on an airport they can let us know what's uh, what's about to happen and then we can either send a legal team out or uh, lean on them with our legislative affairs office in Washington DC if necessary and uh, these are airports if you're a local person that are within 150 miles of Lakeland Florida Airports that uh, don't have a volunteer currently, so if any of these airports are near and dear to any of you here in the crowd, um, stop by our tent and uh, visit the, our airport support network booth. It's uh, staffed the whole time the tent is open and uh, talk to the folks there. Or if you know of any airport that's uh, about to undergo some encroachment that we may want to know about at AOPA, that's what we do with your dues money. We have any AOPA members in here? Good, okay. Well, it's a big bang for the buck for $39 a year, and that's just one of the many things that we do with it, uh, in addition to the safety messages that uh, we are just about to deliver to you. Let's talk about takeoffs and landings for a minute. Um, why all the talk about takeoffs and landings? Uh, we always have heard that uh, those are the most dangerous phases of flight, uh, not only for general aviation aircraft, but for air carrier aircraft too. And it's funny when you think about it why it is that way, because these are things that we do every day. 
uh, when we, you, you don't hear people saying, I'm going to go out and practice uh, uh, my slow flight today. Uh, people generally talk about practice and landings if they're a little bit rusty. You don't even hear about people practicing takeoffs. I guess that's by default if they're practicing landings, they're practicing one takeoff for every landing. But uh, landings are the things that we focus on. Uh, and this uh, presentation is just on takeoffs and landings and uh, some of the foibles associated with them and just a way to make them safer and ways to make them safer for each of us. This isn't new ground for us. We covered this back in uh, seven years ago in 2002 with ups and downs of takeoffs and landings, uh, another ASF presentation that we had. And uh, that was pretty successful. We toured the country with it. About 15,000 pilots saw it. But we haven't really made much of a dent. Takeoffs and landing accidents, as you can see from the statistic statistics that we track, uh, have remained fairly constant. Uh, probably, if anything, just hovering with the amount of uh, air traffic there's been in general aviation. So we thought we'd go at it again, maybe come at it from a different standpoint, and uh, hopefully we can have some results uh, as we look at each year's statistics. Hopefully we can make some dents in these things. And you know, that's exactly what we do at the Air Safety Foundation. We track the, uh, the highest killer items, the things that more pilots are getting in trouble with, and we design our safety message to, uh, to target that. Um, one that we did a while back was uh, the fuel exhaustion, the fuel starvation message. And uh, we actually think we can look at statistics and think that we've made a dent in that. And if you've seen any of our public service announcements on that, some of them are kind of humorous, but they do get the message across. We're trying to do the same thing with takeoffs and landings here. We are a witness to some of the uh, most expert flying in the world right outside here on this runway. Um, we have people doing all of these things. All of these things are things that we are doing as regular old non-air show pilots uh, every time we're take off, uh, making a takeoff or making a landing. And when you think of uh, what's going on at the air show out here, you have people doing every single thing that we're doing, except in that very last one, uh, using skills that erode over time. Uh, these pilots out here are flying a little bit more than the 40 to 50 hour average per year that uh, we've tracked that general aviation pilots are flying. These pilots are flying uh, several hundred hours a year and doing these routines over and over and over and over again. And that's why they're so good and that's why we pay big money to get in the gate and watch them. Um, but think about it. Think about the, the medium performance or low performance airplanes that you and I fly and think of trying to do some of the things that these uh, ladies and gentlemen out here are doing with these airplanes. And uh, you see why takeoffs and landings remains a fairly, uh, a fairly high uh, cause of not only fatalities but just accidents in general in general aviation. We talk a lot about uh, simulation in flying. Um, we can't completely simulate uh, the exact finesse of landing particularly. Takeoff's a little bit easier. Um, there's a lot of book learning we can do. We need to know speeds for airplanes. We need to know configurations for airplanes. But we really need to learn the feel of it. And that last little bit of feel is what you're going to have to get in the air. I can only tell you so much. Uh, the book study helps a little bit. We've all heard what goes up must come down. I know my <coughs> father used to tell me that. My mother was a little disconcerted. I started learning to fly when I was 15, and, uh, and he said, uh, don't worry about it. What goes up must come down, but my mother didn't like that too well. Uh, at the Aero, Aero Safety Foundation, we say what goes down must be able to go back up again with one caveat, and that's uh, without the help of a crane. So we'll review um, the book learning, the science uh, of it, and like I said, that's just basic. There's only a few things we can learn. But we'll delve a little bit into the, uh, the art, the seat of the pants, uh, some of the things that we run across that we have to learn as we're undergoing instruction, uh, not only primary instruction, takeoffs and landings, but as we move on and transition into um, more complex airplanes, bigger airplanes, and getting check, checked out in uh, airplanes we aren't normally used to flying, airplanes that we may not be flying uh, a lot of the time. We have any tailwheel pilots in here besides me? Good, okay. Well, we're not going to be preaching so much to tailwheel pilots. There's a few things that are crossover in here. When we talk about um, the soft field, short field, some of those issues are a little bit different. But that's OK. Uh, Y'all uh, that fly tailwheels uh, have a pretty good idea and know what to do with your feet anyway. Uh, but not that you're uh, not without a few of your own issues. If you read the National Transportation Safety Board, uh, in the 50s when we were trying to go from uh, conventional gear to tricycle gear, uh, that was a real good idea for safety reasons, but you notice that uh, tailwheel aircraft are involved in a lot of runway excursions, shall we say, uh, in the uh, National Transportation Safety Board database. So there's a few problems in the tailwheel industry still as far as keeping the airplane lined up with the runway. But uh, a few things in here for tailwheel pilots too, so don't go away yet. 
Let's jump into the takeoffs. An excerpt from the Diagnostic Manual of Aviation Abnormalities is uh, hyperapplicatus toe brachitis, condition resulting from high foot placement on the rudder pedals. Anyone ever done that? As uh, the more decades I get into being a CFI, when I'm flying with an initial student that's a little bit nervous, that's one thing I like to lean down and check, and that is uh, feet on the brakes. And it uh, seems like every once in a while I don't check, and I get caught with an airplane that doesn't seem to be accelerating very rapidly. And I look down, and sure enough, somebody's toes are on the brakes, or heels are on the brakes, in the case of heel brakes in the, in the J3 Cub. So that's one thing you're going to want to make sure, if you're an instructor, to continue to check. And if you're flying yourself, make sure the case of the nerves doesn't have you with your toes just up a little bit on the brakes. And jumping into takeoffs, how many times has somebody really said to you, nice landing? Hopefully every time. I don't get that every time. But no one really does say nice takeoff. But there is every bit as much finesse, knowledge, and skill involved in a takeoff as there is in a landing. It just works better most of the time. But you think about it, you're at, uh, you're at a very high angle of attack, the highest angle of attack you're probably going to reach during the flight, uh, and obviously at a very low airspeed. We'll look later about the increasing energy, but think about uh, a crosswind takeoff. You're taking off with aileron deflected into the wind. That would be a turn. And as you gain speed, of course, you are reducing your deflection. So the energy is continually changing. And obviously, you're operating your engine probably at the highest level you're going to be operating your engine during the flight. So your engine's at its highest stress. Those of us who live in cold weather climates up in the, the northern latitudes, um, engines at the highest stress at a very cold temperature, maybe the engine's not real warm. So you're really asking a lot of your engine in this situation. Here's the problem, though, with, with uh, takeoffs versus landings. The lethality index for takeoffs, uh, takeoff accidents are 10 times uh, more deadly, according to the 06 statistics, which we've completely compiled. Any ideas why takeoffs are more deadly than landings? Increasing speed, that's a good one. Low altitude. Low altitude. Oh, you're, uh, yeah, you, you're obviously at the, at the low altitude for, uh, for taking off. Anything else? Closer to gross weight. Closer to gross weight, that's a big one. And uh, lethality, you're probably, yeah. When you're on a landing configuration, you're heavily set to land the airplane, whereas when you take off, if you have an engine failure, you've got to do a transition from I'm taking off to, to landing again. To land the airplane. Right, right. Yeah, so your, uh, your configuration, so, so uh, and you're full of fuel too. And, and as far as the lethality index, uh, if something goes wrong, you've got uh, a lot of stuff that burns real fast, uh, real close to you too. So all these things contribute to, uh, to the takeoff accidents being uh, far more dangerous than, than a landing accident. We'll look at some of the, some of the basic techniques and uh, look at some of the areas that have gotten some people in trouble uh, going into the, into the takeoffs. One thing that uh, a carryover from, that we in general aviation got from the airline world is, is the takeoff briefing. Um, and really all the takeoff briefing is just, just a preparation just to put your brain in the, in the mindset of what you're going to do if something goes wrong. The gentleman mentioned about if you have an engine failure on takeoff and you only have one engine, uh, you've got to think of something to do right away, right away, uh, and lower the nose and, and go back into the landing mode. So a takeoff briefing, if you're by yourself, it's okay to talk to yourself, just not okay to answer yourself, right? It's okay to talk to yourself if you're by yourself. Um, or if you have a non-flying passenger, maybe explain what you're doing. But I like to kind of rehearse uh, that maybe if I have my engine fail prior to 1,000 feet above the ground, maybe I'll uh, go straight ahead and land. Or uh, if it's above 1,000 feet above the ground, I will turn back and try to land where I took off from. Um, I try to look and make sure there's no uh, propane farms off the end of the runway if I can see them. Or, puppy stores or school yards or anything like that. Things that, things that might uh, get me in trouble or uh, hurt me or um, alarm the media if I landed on it. So it, it's a good idea to familiarize yourself. Um, I know some of my younger students that are better with computers than I am are uh, getting real good about using Google Earth to look at the uh, takeoff zone and see all the obstacles that are in it. And with an unfamiliar airport, that's a great idea. So the pre-takeoff briefing uh, for yourself and if you have two pilots in the cockpit, it's even better yet, so both pilots understand what's going on. It's a good idea just to familiarize yourself uh, so there's no surprises if something does go wrong. A couple of things to watch. Door latches. Um, if you've stopped by and uh, if you're an AOPA member, then of course you're all in the running for that, that nice new Cirrus, or nearly new Cirrus that we have down there that we're going to give away. But uh, I was flying a Cirrus the other day and there was a little bit of a door latch problem and the door came open on takeoff and uh, that was a little bit of a surprise. And, uh, 
I was IFR and we, we came back and landed. And that was something I hadn't really thought of happening because I was kind of new to the Cirrus and, and uh, hadn't really briefed myself in my takeoff briefing what I was going to do. But uh, word of the wise on that. That's one thing that uh, can interrupt a takeoff. Control locks. That's one thing uh, on this type of control lock we have in the picture here, the Cessna control lock. It's real easy to see, real difficult to take off and leave that control lock in place. But uh, I had one happen to uh, a gentleman that's in my hangar row the other day, and he sheepishly told me about it, thinking maybe I could pass the message on in, uh, in a safety seminar. But he was in a, uh, an Aviat Husky, his Husky, and uh, it was real windy the time before, and he tied the stick, the rear stick, with a seat belt. And uh, that was how he kept the controls from blowing around. And he said he kind of forgot about it, went home, and uh, came back next weekend and went flying. And he admitted that when he taxied out, he didn't really do a full control check. And when it came time to take off, he pushed the stick forward. And of course, the uh, rear stick was securely uh, wrapped with the rear seat belt. And uh, no harm, no foul. He wasn't moving at all. But all of a sudden, he realized he didn't have any forward stick authority. So. If uh, I always kind of secretly held in the back of my mind, who could be so stupid as to take off with a control lock in? Well, it sounds real easy because uh, I've done that before in, uh, in a Cub and a Husky, and that's secure a, uh, a stick with a seat belt. Not a real good idea if it's something you can forget about. Obstructions in the area, trees and buildings. Of course, you get uh, disrupted wind flow. Uh, something to look around before you start your takeoff roll, maybe halfway down the runway uh, is an obstruction. And if you have a crosswind, you're going to get some disturbed air from that uh, obstruction. Just one more thing you can prep yourself on. Of course, foot placement, we talked about that. Or heel placement in the case of brakes. Make sure everything is clear. And uh, winds. Now, uh, we get reported winds and we get wind gusts. And you notice when we talked about book learning, we talked about um, maximum demonstrated crosswind component. That's for landing. You always see that in the landing section. What's the most crosswind this airplane will take on landing is what we always try to think to ourselves. But you ever think about takeoffs? There's no, there's no maximum demonstrated crosswind component that you think applies to takeoff. I think we have to, as, as safe pilots, I think we have to apply some common sense here, though. I, I think if it's too strong to land, it's probably too strong to take off. I think we can, it's safe for us to make that assumption in our pilot operating handbooks. So. Um, that gust, I like to include that gust, because what is the definition of gust when, the, when Lakeland Tower says the wind is uh, 360 at 12 gusting 15, is that an instantaneous gust just like that, or is that a whoosh that builds up to 15 and, and then abates? There's no real definition of gust when they give you gust winds. So whatever the wind is, plus the gust, I like to consider that the wind, and, and I think that's fair as far as trying to operate safely and keep the airplane within the bounds of what it will do with the controls that you have. Crosswinds, we talked about uh, ailerons uh, into the wind and rolling out gradually. Let's just look and take a quick look. There's no audio on this, but just take a quick look at a crosswind takeoff. Still weather baiting into the wind, you see that? There's no aileron into the wind on that. No aileron at all, you saw. And now the airplane crabs into the wind. As, as it takes off. Uh, so you, you saw the rudder inputs and holding the airplane on the ground all the way until, uh, until flying speed is attained and then a very positive liftoff. A couple more things to watch. Terrain. And this is another thing that uh, in Part 91 we're not required to watch. The airlines are real big on something they call second segment climb. So the airlines compute how long it's going to take to get off the ground and then they make you add 40 or 60 percent to that. And then after you get off the ground the airlines then want the operators to compute the second segment climb, and that's all the terrain that's going to be in the climb out up to a specific altitude. So they figure that very carefully. So taking off in an airport, uh, take the one in this picture here, obviously your second segment climb or your climb after takeoff uh, is going to be something that is going to be a factor unless you have an airplane that could climb over it very well. Most of the uh, current pilot operating handbooks have information in there for takeoff distances and landing distances on hard, dry surfaces and then on uh, grass. But it doesn't say anything about tall grass. And I have a feeling that those um, pilot operating handbook figures that you have for grass were probably uh, computed on something that looks a lot like a putting green. Um, it's going to be pretty hard grass. It's going to be pretty short grass. It's going to be dry grass. And that's how those figures come up. And you'll see a caveat in the uh, takeoff section or landing section. It'll say, add 10% to takeoff roll for 
uh, dry grass surfaces. But tall grass is one that uh, you're really on your own if you're venturing into that area on landing as far as getting good performance. Um, rough surfaces, of course, landing on sandbars or what have you, that's another one that uh, no book figures are published for most of the conventional airplanes that we're flying. Another thing, too, that uh, we can't really plan for, uh, and we've had a few accidents in the last couple of years on the, in some coastal cities here in Florida, and that is encountering uh, instrument conditions or dark conditions right after takeoff. And that's something that you can look around and see. If you're taking off out over the water, uh, particularly out over the Gulf, uh, facing west at night, you really have no horizon at all taking off. If you're a VFR-only pilot, that can be a real surprise. Uh, sadly enough, uh, one of the accidents that happened most recently on the west coast of Florida, highly experienced pilot took off uh, with, with a lot of Navy and, uh, and civilian time, too. And uh, it was VFR and IMC. The uh, gentleman just lost control of the airplane. And I honestly don't think taking off out of a brightly lit airport with city all around, he was faced west. I honestly think it just caught him by surprise. Uh, no um, abnormalities with the airplane. Uh, and the airplane went into the, into the water. Uh, a loss of a completely good airplane. And according to the National Transportation Safety Board, um, the pilot had just really not had the situational awareness to realize that it was going to be completely black outside the windshield after takeoff. Density altitude is another one. And uh, of course, we're coming up on the season where we get it. We're here in Florida operating pretty close to sea level, but as soon as we venture out into the mountain west uh, during the summertime, we get density altitudes that are up eight, 9,000 feet, pretty common. And uh, I don't know about what you fly, but in my uh, Cessna 172 that was built back when I was in fifth grade, um, it doesn't do too well at density altitudes of, of eight or 9,000 feet. I had the, uh, the privilege a couple of years ago of flying down in uh, New Guinea and Indonesia with some of the missionary pilots from Mission Aviation Fellowship. A very tightly run organization. It's obviously uh, foreign overseas. It's not governed by FAA Part 91, FAR Part 91. Um, it's governed by the local regulations. But they had a very strict procedure. And we were operating out of some very high mountain airports, uh, over 5,000 feet elevation. Temperature was around 100 degrees. And uh, I got invited to go on a trip. And they said, well, meet us at the airport about 3.30 in the morning. And uh, I thought, well, that was an odd time to meet at the airport. Well, Turned out they wanted me to help them load concrete block onto this airplane, so we got all that done. We took off about 4.30, and it was still real dark. This is right on the equator, um, south of Guam. And uh, we flew for about an hour or so. Finally, the sun came up, and I finally had the courage to ask, why on earth are we up so early? And they said, if we don't get in and out of this strip by 8.30 in the morning, um, we can't do it. And I said, well, who said? And he said, well, that's just what we figured out is a safe way to do it. And sure enough, we landed a strip at about 5,500 feet at about 7.30 in the morning. And uh, it's 5,500 feet above sea level. And the density altitude was computed around 9,000 feet. And we were in a Cessna 208 caravan. And we did get in and we did get out. But judging by the margins, I certainly wouldn't have wanted to do that in the middle of the day. And uh, judging by all the jungle around, I certainly wouldn't want to spend the night up there either. So some hard, fast rules like that keep an organization like that safe. And there's n really no reason why we can't do the same for ourselves. Not maybe make out an operating manual for ourselves like some of these organizations do, but just a little rule of thumb that you have, maybe uh, your own personal tenant that you won't violate, and that is maybe not operate over uh, density altitudes that are uh, more than 3,000 feet or 5,000 feet. Whatever the comfort level of, of you are with your airplane's performance is really all it is to keep safe. We have about a dozen density altitude accidents per year in general aviation. And uh, since I've been tracking them uh, for several years, I've never seen one um, that uh, just would have happened. It looks to me like every time it happens, a pilot tries to push it, a pilot tries to go a little bit too far. Let's look at a density altitude on takeoff. And uh, this one just be, happened to be captured by a camera crew from a local TV station. We have an A36 Bonanza. Uh, in Northern California, Rancho Palos Verdes, I think. Takes off. Does that look like a pretty normal takeoff so far? We're on the center line. Can't see how much runway is left. And uh, let's take a look at some of the nuts and bolts of the takeoff, though. Um, it was an 836 Bonanza. There's uh, six seats in the Bonanza normally. Anyone fly the 836 besides myself? I came down here in an 836. Good. You have all six seats in yours? You do, okay. Who else flies an 836? Any, do you load them all up regularly? No, okay, good. We, uh, the AOPA, we have a, a bonanza we use for business travel, and we have actually one of the six seats is taken out because we figure it would be very, very rare for us to load all those seats. So four adults in the bonanza, very capable airplane, but it, it won't take six adults. 
The uh, baggage, when the NTSB offloaded the baggage and weighted, it came to 271 pounds. They drained out 60 gallons of fuel, but uh, some fuel had already leaked out, so it may have been up near its total of 72 gallons of fuel. Temperature was 107 degrees on the uh, AWOS at a nearby airport. You notice that was an asphalt runway, and of course black tends to absorb heat. So it was estimated by the fire department that came to the scene that the temperature over the runway might have been as much as 115 degrees. So that's kind of off the charts for the Beechcraft uh, Bonanza. Let's take a look at the rest of the accident. We get off the ground and we're climbing uh, at a reasonable speed, which starts to get off a little bit and decrease a little bit. Just prior to impact, the pilot pulled back the, uh, the throttle when he realized that uh, he was having a problem and, uh, and the airplane hit the ground and cartwheeled. Two lives were lost in that accident, a couple of injuries as well. Um, and the NTSB uh, looked at it very carefully and there was a couple of assumptions that they made, but either making the assumptions uh, conservatively uh, or otherwise, the runway was about 4,000 feet. It either needed, or the runway is 4,050. It either needed 4,020 or 4,100. It was somewhere in there, but it was so close. There was just very little margin. And uh, that's putting a lot of trust in the book figures of the airplane. That's putting a lot of trust in the performance capability of the airplane, particularly at not a brand new airplane that you're actually developing the, um, the horsepower uh, that it takes. When you see something going wrong and you're going to abort the takeoff, obviously aborting the takeoff at a slow speed is a, is a heck of a lot better than aborting the takeoff at a high speed. Um, your stop distance quadruples uh, as, as your speed doubles. So think about the, all the things that you're going to abort a takeoff for as you're rolling down the runway. Um, you might abort the takeoff for uh, an open door uh, at a slow speed, but if you're at a high speed and you not, don't have very much runway left, um, and if your airplane will fly with an open door, which most air, general aviation airplanes that we fly will, uh, there might not be as much reason to abort that takeoff at a very high speed. My, uh, my initial training flying, uh, flying the 727 at American Airlines, I was uh, 26 years old and I had a full head of hair and uh, I <coughs> thought I was doing pretty good flying the 727 from the right seat. And uh, so the captain said to me, he said, well, why don't you give the takeoff briefing? So. Uh, I started down the takeoff briefing and I said, well, if, uh, if anything happens prior to, uh, prior to us taking off, then we will abort the takeoff, and uh, if it happens after, then we'll come back and land. And he said, really? He said, really? If anything happens, we'll abort the takeoff? He said, how about that cup of coffee you have over there that falls down into your kit bag, your flight bag? He said, you're going to abort the takeoff for that? So uh, that got me to thinking early on in my career that uh, it's really got to be important if I'm going to abort the takeoff at the very last minute prior to lifting off. Uh, especially on, on a runway that's short where I really don't have uh, uh, very many options. From the, uh, for single engine airplanes, the accelerate stop distance is not something that's published, but it's something you can think about and think about uh, how long it takes you to accelerate, how long it's going to take you to make a decision to stop, and then how long it's going to take you to stop. And that would be your balanced field length that's called in, uh, in multi-engine flying, and that's accelerate, think about stopping and stop. And you know, part 121 uh, airline operations, they actually build in in time of indecision. You see the yellow uh, line on the chart there, uh, the reaction time. And uh, when something bad happens in an airliner at 140 knots on the runway, the FAA realizes that we're all not Superman, we're all not Tom Cruise. It's gonna take us a couple of seconds to think, geez, that's uh, pretty bad. I'm gonna stop and then finally pulling the throttles back uh, initiating maximum braking, maybe thrust reverse two if that's available, and stopping the airplane. And that's assuming an intact airplane where we don't have uh, uh, tires that are, or brakes that have failed and uh, tires that have failed. So something to think about, a balanced field length in a single engine airplane, do you have room to do all those things? So we compute our ground roll distance to the rotation speed in a couple of seconds uh, at the rotation speed, the landing ground roll to come up with the total distance for accelerate and stop. Talked about the differences between uh, tailwheel aircraft and uh, tricycle gear aircraft, of course. And uh, I did have to throw a picture of my favorite airplane in here, the Aviat Husky, uh, even though that's a tailwheel airplane. So these short field, soft field are, are tricycle gear techniques, of course. And uh, if you've taken a, a, a practical test for the private pilot practical, of course, recently for your soft field takeoff, 
That's one no-go item that the examiner will down you on if you're taking a private pilot check ride, and that is soft field rolling onto the runway, not stopping, and going right into the soft field takeoff configuration. That is full back elevator uh, takeoff, remain in ground effect, and climb uh, at uh, either VX or VY. We talked about uh, the ability for your engine to develop the maximum power or the rated horsepower. Uh, I don't know about your, what you fly, but I know that my 35-year-old engine that hasn't had the, uh, the overhaul because it's fairly low time probably is not developing the 150 horsepower that Cessna said it was developing back when it was delivered brand new in 1973. So we need to give our pilot operating handbooks just a, a look at them just with a little bit of a jaundiced eye, if you will. Um, you're not going to get book figures, but what kind of figures are you going to get? Well, at the Air Safety Foundation, we try to come up with some uh, easy rules of thumb so we don't have to do the, the complicated math. But we like to add 50% to the distance over 50-foot obstacles. So if the pilot operating handbook says we need 1,200 feet, figure 1,800 feet. Most of the runways that we operate off of are not going to be shorter than 2,000 feet when you think about it. So if you build yourself a little slack in on the takeoff uh, performance data, you're building yourself in just that much more safety. And going back to the beginning with the safety statistics, um, we need to build that little bit more safety in because a lot of these accidents are pilots trying to operate their airplanes uh, in very maximum configuration. If we could have the sound from uh, Hal in the control room up there, please. We'll jump into uh, landings. Spectacular short finalitis, rapid erratic control movements during takeoffs and landings. And if the CFI is present, accompanied by loud vocalizations, take over your airplane. Let's take a look at some landings here. I'd like to say that no actual airplanes were harmed in the production of this video, but I have a feeling on that last one there was some uh, quality time spent with an A&P mechanic after that. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if you reckon, anyone ever been to our uh, AOPA fly-in up in Frederick in, uh, in June of every year we used to have it? We're not having it this year, but uh, we were looking for some footage and we decided when we had fly-in to go out and film all of our guests flying in one day. That's where we got a lot of that footage there from that Cessna 182 that was doing the nose wheel dance there. I got to thinking afterwards, that probably wasn't very nice to invite all of our friends over and then take pictures of them landing. So <laughs> we redacted the tail numbers, how's that? But uh, hopefully it's a good learning experience. But um, we, we, saw, we saw landings there that uh, were kind of ugly that might have resulted in some, uh, some damage to the airplane, particularly landing on the nose, that's a no-no. But uh, landing is not a beauty contest. And uh, it's not a good idea to really try to finesse it if you're using up too much runway, if you're just trying to make it good for the sake of being good. Anybody made a bad landing before? <laughs> Never made a bad landing? Oh, okay, all right. All right. Uh, let me tell you about one of my bad landings. And I'm not talking about something that's, that goes in the NTSB database. I'm just talking about a really bad landing. Um, th that, that first day I was talking about learning to fly, uh, learning to fly the 727, I, uh, it was my sixth landing, and my first five were perfect. I thought I had it down. And on the sixth one, uh, it was blowing. And it was at Washington National Airport in Washington, D.C. And it was March, and the wind was 26 knots, and it was from about 50 degrees, and uh, well within the capability of the airplane. And we hit so hard that we were in the air, which is hard to do in a 727 because you have spoilers. So we hit that hard, and we were in the air, and somebody keyed the mic. There was a long line of Eastern Airlines airplanes. That was when Eastern was still in business. So 
some wise guy keyed the mic and said, oh boy, when we were still in the air. I remember that about it. And when we came down the second time, um, we came down good and hard. And the captain said, well, we'll leave the uh, cockpit door closed when we get to the gate so no one will see who's in here. So I thought that was a good idea. It was a little trick I learned. Used a lot later on in my, <laughs> later on in my career. Used that trick a few times for myself and for co-pilots that were acting like I was that day. And uh, <clears throat> finally, after all the people were off, the mechanic knocked on the door and he said, uh, looks like the rubber jungle back here. And I didn't know what that meant. Well, you know all those rubber oxygen masks that, that hang down? Well, they'll come down if uh, the pressure is not enough and they need to be, but did you know if you hit really hard, they can come down too? So I'll ask again, has anyone ever had a bad landing? Got any more hands? Okay, okay, we've got a couple more hands. All right, come back in a year if I ask that, I'll bet I'll get more hands yet. So we're gonna have bad landings that don't hurt the airplane. I learned how to repack oxygen masks that day. It's not that hard. Just wind up the little cord with a pencil and stuff it in there and close the lid. So after that, I thought maybe the latches were weak on those little doors. I'm not sure. But it was a pretty hard landing. So, uh, the, but like I said, the, the bad ones are usually uh, a lot worse feeling than they are worse looking. But think of all we're trying to do with a landing here. We're trying to get from, uh, not just from the traffic pattern, but from our cruise altitude all the way to, down to the ground. We want to remain controlled all the time, and we don't want to be near the outer limits of our performance. Think about takeoffs. We're near the outer limits of our performance. But we want to maintain a speed above stall speed all the way down. Uh, maybe a full stall landing is within your, your uh, book of tricks. But, um, and you want to use a reasonable amount of runway. I, I flew with uh, Phil Boyer just before he retired. Um, and I know some of you probably met Phil. And he's kind of a, a hard guy to get to know. And I never really knew him all that well the whole time I worked there. But I flew with him a couple times. And he had to go pick up one of his airplanes up in Pennsylvania. And I flew him up there in our Bonanza. And I was hell-bent and determined to make a good landing with, uh, with Phil on board. So he was sitting there not saying anything. And we landed up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It was a 7,000-foot runway. And I think I probably used about 2,000 of it trying to finesse the landing. And we finally landed. And I didn't want to put the brakes on. And we rolled through the intersection. It was an airport we'd both been to before. And I thought, wow, that's a lot of runway we used. And Phil looked around and he says, boy, I've never been down here before. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that was, that was a nice way of Phil telling me that I used up a lot more runway than I needed to. And when I turned around and looked back at six of the 7,000 feet runway and realized that a Beechcraft A36 Bonanza probably only needs about 1,000 feet, I guess I was trying to do a little bit too good a job finessing it. And even so, it wasn't that good of a landing. So figure you pay federal income tax, you own all that runway, right? <laughs> So uh, a greaser, when someone tells you a good landing, I, I like to take that with a grain of salt. If, if someone that really knows how to land an airplane tells me good landing, I, I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, if it's my, uh, my kids or my grandmother that tells me it's a good landing, they don't know a whole lot about landing, so maybe it was a bad landing, but it just happened to be real good at touchdown. That's what always used to make me a little bit perturbed about flying international flight. You fly for 15 hours on a flight from New York to, uh, to Buenos Aires, and uh, you get there and you land, and you have a bad landing. And the customers, the passengers, always judge that entire flight by that last couple of seconds. So you might have navigated through the airspace of, of 27 different countries. You've talked in a couple different languages. You stayed up all night. You drank 15 cups of coffee. You make one bad landing, and they get off the, and they say, "Oh man, last time I rode on Delta, it was better than that." So, so uh, sometimes, sometimes you just have to do the safe thing. Fly the airplane like you're taught to fly it. Fly it by the book. You might get a thumper out of it, but it's a safe landing. Um, if, if you really want to start an argument in an air show, um, talk about Republicans or Democrats. And uh, you can also talk about uh, crosswind landings. You're going to go wing low on a crosswind landing or you're going to go crab on a crosswind landing. And then there's some people that are going to do the combination. So a lot of different techniques. If you want to talk about uh, crosswind landing techniques, I'll probably spend the rest of the afternoon talking about them with you if I had time. Uh, but there's a few basic things that we have to have in our landings. Um, the airplane has to be lined up with a runway. And, uh, you know, that's one thing I always, I, I sometimes, I, I get a little impatient with students sometimes, and I am an active flight instructor. I have three students right now. I, I always, my wife doesn't let me have more because I do work full time at, at AOPA, but I always try to keep three students so I have somebody to talk about when I'm doing safety seminars. And I think some of them are in here too, by the way. No, this will be good. So, um, I, I always wonder, why on earth are you lined up with the edge of the runway? And I think that to myself, and I try not to say it because it's not a good idea to talk to students like that when you're a flight instructor. And if you've ever had your flight instructor talk to you like that, you can ask them not to. But that, that's what I think sometimes. I think, why on earth are you lined up with the edge of the runway? And uh, I, I think that a student doesn't have a good reason to do that. Well, 
I learned to fly that uh, Cirrus down there. Um, when we uh, give it away to one of you, when you win it, um, myself or uh, editor Dave Hirschman, we're going to fly it to your location. We're going to give you your 10 hours of factory training because we're both factory instructors now, and, uh, and then sign you off in it and give it to you. So get ready for that. It's in February. So we had to go through Cirrus training uh, with a Cirrus factory instructor. So I'd never flown a Cirrus before. So there I was, and it was a little bit windy. That's my excuse. And uh, Instructor, and I thought I was doing pretty good. I was lined up with a runway that I always line up on. I teach on that runway, Frederick, runway 23. And uh, he said, he said, why on earth are you lined up with the edge of the runway? And you know what, that was, after 29 years of instructing, I thought, it took me that long to learn why students are lining up with the edge of the runway? I was distracted. I had so many other things to do. I was trying to keep my airspeed right on. I was trying to keep my, uh, uh, my configuration just right. And sure enough, I looked, and when he said that, I had to laugh, because I, I said to him, and he was just, he was a kid. Uh, <laughs> He had all his hair, and, and, uh, <laughs> and I said, you sound like me. <laughs> and he said, why are you lined up with the edge of the runway? So horizontal alignment, that's, uh, that's the first thing. Um, vertical alignment, of course, we have good vertical guidance. We have um, um, approach slope indicators, the PAPI or the VASI, or we have electronic guidance in the cockpit. So there's really no reason uh, in most of the airplanes we fly to not have our vertical alignment and our longitudinal alignment, that is at the time of touchdown, particularly in tailwheel airplanes, unless you want the uh, uh, round end to be swapped around with a pointy end, longitudinal alignment is very, very important. Um, it's uncomfortable to touch down in a crab in a uh, tricycle gear airplane. So longitudinal alignment is very important as well. Airspeed control is, uh, is the final icing on the cake. If you have all of those taken care of, I'm not going to guarantee a good landing, but I'm going to guarantee a pretty safe landing. And most of the time, it'll be a landing that uh, you might be proud of. But it's not going to be a landing that's going to be uh, on the evening news or above the fold in, uh, in USA Today. Think back, if you've ever had a bad landing, some of the things that, uh, that, that might have caused it. Uh, and I've uh, thought back a lot of times about that landing where I dropped all those rows of oxygen masks. I said I was blaming it on the wind. That's, I can't really go there because the wind was within limits. Blame it on my inexperience, maybe. That might have. But uh, I hadn't really had my airspeed under control. I was jockeying with the throttles all the way down in the wind. And uh, my general inexperience uh, led to me making a bad landing. And uh, the captain who was training me in his wisdom let me make that bad landing and it taught me a lot of good lessons. So uh, I still remember it after 20 plus 25 years. So uh, all the way from cruise we're thinking about that um, all, all the way down. Are, are we going to be in a position for that last couple of uh, minutes on the approach to be stabilized on the approach. ATC request, last minute. We have parallel runways here. I love to help out ATC when I can, uh, but if I'm at 300 feet and they say, hey, can you slide, sw uh, slide over and take the other runway? Um, if I can safely do it, I will. I can say I love to accommodate ATC requests, but if I can't safely do it, uh, unable is, is a perfectly acceptable response to an ATC request if I can't safely do it. You don't get a hero medal if you try to do it and then have a problem on landing. Uh, just the opposite, because you'll probably be blocking a runway if you have a problem. Uh, the air traffic controllers won't be so, uh, won't be so happy with it. Traffic issues uh, at a field. Um, you may uh, have non-radio airplanes in the pattern in a non-towered field, and that's something that those pop up ahead of you, and all of a sudden you have a change of plans. Um, abnormal weather. For most of us to fly VFR, that might just be winds. Um, if you fly IFR, though, um, if you've done a really, really low visibility approach, and I'm talking about visibility half mile, category one ILS minimums, uh, down to 1800 RVR, you see a different sight picture when you break out at minimums. You see a completely different sight picture with uh, 2,000 feet of RVR than you do on a clear day. And if you've never actually done that for the first time, I will tell you right now exactly what will happen. When you break out on a really low visibility approach and you see the runway, you will go high on the glide slope. Everybody does. You'll do it in a simulator. You'll do it uh, in the real airplane. And unless you've braced yourself, told yourself that when I break out, I'm going to keep following the glide slope down or I'm going to keep my descent rate at the same rate, natural to human tendency, as soon as you see something that low that you're close to and you're seeing it for the first time, you're going to pull back a little bit. And every time you'll go high. It's okay if it's a 10,000 foot runway, you've got plenty. But uh, I recently did an approach, ILS approach, to a 3,200 foot runway up in uh, uh, Provincetown, uh, I'm sorry, at the, at the end of Cape uh, Cod up there. It's not promised down, I forgot what it was, but uh, it amazed me there was an ILS that we shot down to minimums that, on a 3,200 foot runway. And that wasn't a whole lot to play with, and I was glad that I uh, knew not to pull. 
If you race NASCAR or if you ride horses uh, in the ring, you know about the word collected. Um, a stabilized approach, the airplane is collected. It's uh, everything stabilized uh, for the last, you say the number. The airlines uh, and why they have such a good safety record all require a thousand foot stabilization. Um, that's how they get uh, good insurance rates and that's why um, the airline safety record is, is what it is. So at a thousand feet the airplane is completely configured, flaps and gear. The airspeed is approach speed uh, within 10 knots of approach speed, plus 10, not minus 10. And so then from that point on down at a thousand feet above the ground all the way down the airplane is um, stabilized and there's no surprises, no turns, no nothing. We don't have that luxury in our GA operations. We're flying a pattern Sometimes we're turning onto final approach at 400 feet, 500 feet in a pattern. But uh, something to think about is, is try to make our approaches as stabilized as possible. Instrument approaches. This is one thing that uh, we're all law-abiding, tax-paying, uh, FAR-abiding citizens. And it's real easy to get in trouble. And I want to show you an approach chart. I just picked one out. Uh, still had one in this presentation from the West Coast. And you can't read the whole thing, and that doesn't matter. But uh, if you look down at the bottom there, the... Um, minimum descent altitude on this non-precision approach, GPS approach to runway 34, the minimum descent altitude is about 700 feet above the ground. Well, if you look very closely at the approach, and I'll uh, cursor up to it, look very closely at the approach, that's the missed approach point right there that the arrow is pointing to. And at that point, which is right over the runway, you are at 700 feet on the approach. Like I said, you abide by the rules, you do everything you're supposed to do. Uh, you are supposed to touch down in the touchdown zone. This runway is 3,500 feet long, I think. Um, and there you are at 700 feet over the threshold of the runway. There's really no good, safe way to get down. I know what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to pull the throttle all the way back and chop it and drop it, um, but that's really not a safe way to make an approach. If that runway was wet, it's a pretty good chance any airplane I fly, including a J3 Cub, is not going to come down from 700 feet and land on the remaining runway safely. Some of the shapes you see that you get used to. These are not things you memorize. These are things that as you've been flying you just already know this. The different shapes of being high, low, and just right. And you recognize those. These are not things like I say that you study in books or put on index cards and look at. But um, that's, that's the shape that you're seeing. This runway looks just about right looking out the windshield. Just that shape. Forward slips. Can your airplane do them? If it can't do a forward slip, probably there's a placard that says uh, no slips or no slips with flaps extended or no slips with uh, less than quarter tanks of fuel or various uh, restrictions on slips. Good way to get down uh, if you need to get down in a hurry or if you're in an airplane that doesn't have flaps, it's uh, about the only way to get down in a hurry uh, if you need to. Um, I've slipped airplanes all the way up to the, the size of um, ones that I probably shouldn't have been slipping and they're all pretty aerodynamic and they all slip pretty well. You don't have to have a full slip as you transition into it. That's a little uncomfortable, uh, but a partial slip will increase your descent rate just as well. We call it the Goldilocks principle with airspeed though as we're trying to dissipate airspeed on final. Not too cold, not too hot, but just right. Speaking of too hot, if we could have a bit of volume upstairs in the control room. And we'll take a look at uh, the Mooney. Anyone flown the, flown the J, K, or S, R series of the Mooney? Very clean airplane, very clean wing. And if it's down near the ground. That wasn't staged, I promise. We were out shooting some footage in North Carolina, and, and somebody said, hey, here comes a Mooney, and he looks kind of hot, and the cameraman turned around and got that whole thing. I, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, airspeed control, and, th and that's one thing about being stabilized. Um, and, of course, some of those bad landings uh, result from you having your landing uh, at five feet above the runway. Maybe you thought the runway was uh, five feet higher, or last time you were there it was five feet higher. That's your excuse. And uh, pitch control. Depth perception is something that really gets us. And notice how in your nighttime flying, your landings can be completely different because you're using a completely different set of cues out in your peripheral vision. That's why FAR Part 91 requires uh, currency, uh, or Part 61 requires night currency, because you're using a whole different set of skills for night landing uh, that affects your depth perception and your pitch control. Picture of, uh, of firewall damage, if you look really closely on that airplane, 
But uh, think, we talk about landing gear, we talk about the landing gear tires, we talk about main landing gear. Um, try not to think of your nose gear as part of your, your landing gear, because if you're landing on the nose gear like we saw earlier, you're probably going to be spending some quality shop time yourself. And uh, straightening out a bent firewall on some of these airplanes that involves removing the engine too is a very expensive process. Um, wing position and the, clean, the cleanness of the airplane, the aerodynamic cleanness. Of course, in the middle of the J3 Cub, you pull the throttle back, you've got gear struts, you've got two sets of wing struts, you've got tail struts, you've got struts everywhere you look on an airplane like that, and uh, it will slow down when you pull the throttle back. Take a look at the Mooney on the bottom or the Cirrus on the top, and the aerodynamic cleanness when you pull the throttle back, as you saw with the Mooney, the airplane is going to do a lot of floating. This was an actual picture that we took that day of the fly-in that you saw those uh, pictures of the airplane doing some skidding and uh, somebody flat spotted a tire. The airplane landed a little fast, no big deal, but we just happened to look over and saw a bunch of people gathered around one of those airplanes that landed and uh, decided we'd take, snap a picture of it when they weren't looking. That uh, crosswind component chart that we talked about, and we talked about learning some of the numbers uh, getting the book knowledge as opposed to getting the seat of the pants knowledge. That crosswind component was put there for a reason. Um, that crosswind component chart was made up by some very experienced pilots that had a lot of time in the airplane and they found the very most crosswind that they could find. Maybe the airplane will take more, they just couldn't find more that day. But they found as much uh, crosswind as they could find and they found out about how much rudder they had to counteract with uh, to keep the airplane going straight down the runway to keep the longitudinal access of the airplane aligned with the center line. They computed that and when they got in a condition where they actually ran out of rudder and were touching down in a crab, then they took that number, uh, the, the maximum crosswind component is the speed that they can keep the airplane rolling straight down the runway. So that was not just, uh, just pulled out of a computer, that was something that's the demonstrated crosswind component, which means that somebody actually demonstrated. Somebody that, uh, like I say, that was really, really good at it. Um, completely okay to touch down on the upwind wheel in a crosswind because you remember you're holding that wing down into the wind and obviously essential to point the rudder, uh, use the rudder to point the nose down the runway, particularly in a tailwheel airplane, but definitely in a, in a tricycle gear airplane too. Getting into your, uh, some more of the book knowledge, most of your uh, pilot operating handbooks, most of them I'll say, not all of them, in a crosswind call for the minimum amount of flaps uh, for the runway length um, in a short field. That's one place that it doesn't say in the book that you're going to run into some problems. But in a short field, if it says use the minimum amount of flaps for a crosswind, but yet it says short field use maximum flaps, you're not going to get your book figure in a case like that. So that's one place where we need to use our uh, common pilot sense uh, to, get us, uh, to keep us out of trouble. More, one more thing like discussed with takeoffs with uh, long grass or wet grass, um, there's no charts for frost on grass or ice on grass, uh, no charts for standing water. Um, some of the airlines have charts for standing water and it costs a lot to make those demonstrations, but we really don't have much information on that. So uh, hydroplaning can occur at about the speeds of touchdown in most of the airplanes that we fly, about 50, uh, 50 to 60 knots. Runway slope is another big one. In general, uh, we don't take off uphill, but there are exceptions to that. And I've found that the very best information on this, not only in the airport uh, facilities directory, but those old guys that you always see sitting around on porches around the airport uh, or in the mountain strips around the campsites, uh, that's usually your best source of information is uh, people that are uh, local at the airport that can uh, give you the do's and don'ts, and usually it's take off downhill and land uphill. Get a fair amount of accidents with uh, go-around mistakes and people forgetting that when they go around, not only do they have to push that throttle in, but that right foot has to go in as well. We had a pretty high profile mistake with a, uh, a go-around mistake with a Columbia 350 uh, up in North Carolina at this strip here. The airplane touched down about midfield a little fast and uh, at that point attempted to do a go-around that was not coordinated very well with the rudder. The airplane veered off the runway and hit several other, other airplanes parked uh, right next to the runway in the parking lot, in the parking area. Fairly uh, experienced pilot, but very low time in type in the airplane. It was a new airplane. And uh, the NTSB report listed this as just an improperly handled go around. Nothing wrong with the airplane. Getting up into the mountain strips, uh, we call it special cruise certification with the airlines, but uh, some strips uh, you might want to try going into with somebody that's been there before prior to trying it by yourself. Airport Facilities Directory or uh, our AOPA Directory has some good tips on uh, some of these things and once again the local procedure.
Just wrapping up, a couple of the mandatory things like we talked about before, the alignment, not only horizontal and vertical, but uh, longitudinal and airspeed. Your currency, what you used to be able to do, you might not be able to do right now, and you're in control of the airplane, not the airplane's in control of you. If it ever crosses your mind that you might need to go around, pretty good chance that you do need to go around. If we could have some volume right here at the end, please, from the control room. On first line. Support groups are becoming an increasingly common method of long-term treatment for addiction and are even popping up for some less familiar conditions. Let's eavesdrop on a group session for pilots having trouble landing their airplanes. Everyone, we have a new attendee here today. Scott, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, hi. <laughs> uh, my name's Scott and I have a landing problem. Mm. Well, at first I didn't think it was a big deal, you know? A few extra knots on final here and there, a missing a taxiway turn off once in a while. It's no biggie, right? I guess I was just fooling myself until the day I finally admitted that I was, well, that I was addicted to speed. Mm -hmm. I, I took my little girl up for a ride and we came back into land and we were floating down the runway in ground effect like normal and she looks up at me, big brown eyes, and she says, Daddy, when are we going to land? I, I just lost it then and there, and I promised her that Daddy was going to get some help. And she would never have to worry about not landing again. There is nothing to be ashamed of, man. I was addicted to speed for 10 years years before some good people at the airport got together and staged an intervention. Ten years? Try 30. Except for me, speed was just the beginning. I developed a terrible case of the crabs. I just couldn't touch down in a crosswind without sideloading the gear. And tell the group how you finally beat it, Gary. One day at a time. I went to the landing clinic here in town and the instructors gave me some initial treatment. After that, it was just sheer willpower and the support and tips of all you guys. I've been uh, clean five years now, and I'll never touch down in a crab again. Clearly, the group therapy and support concept can be applied to a wide range of conditions, but will it ultimately help Scott with his landing problems? Only time will tell. All right, don't make me bring the intervention clinic to Lakeland, Florida next year. Go out there and practice those takeoffs and those landings. Thank you very much for coming. Good job, JJ. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Well, you know, folks, uh, JJ's going to be the next speaker we have here so uh you know talking about gps i believe right yes sir so stay tuned come back take a break make it happen